Thank you, Marissa, for that uh, introduction. Um, so let's begin. Uh, so first, a little bit about myself. Uh, about 15 years ago, uh, and a few years after that, I was the creator and maintainer of uh, the kernel-based virtual machine. And so I participated in many Linux Foundation events. Uh, Later, uh, I was the creator of the CSTAR IO framework, and I'm working on CELADB, where I'm the CTO and co-founder. Uh, for those who are wondering, uh, the virtual background behind me is a screenshot from the movie The Black Hole from 1978. So if you recognize it, that's good for you, but also it means that uh, you're old. Um, so let's, let's begin with the presentation. Uh, a little bit about the structure. So the presentation is both generic in that it doesn't uh, apply only to CLDB. It's, it's something that you can apply in your applications as well. But I will also explain how the principles uh, within it apply to CLDB. And for those who are not familiar, uh, CLDB is a high throughput uh, distributed NoSQL database. Uh, so you can scale out by uh, adding more nodes is necessary if you need more storage or more compute. Uh, it is uh, compatible with the uh, three different uh, protocols. Um, so uh, the Cassandra protocol, the first protocol we supported, uh, and also Redis and Amazon DynamoDB. Uh, of these, only Cassandra and DynamoDB are really supported uh, for production use. Uh, Redis is uh, not a mature implementation. Uh, but Cassandra and DynamoDB are mature and are used in uh, production for many years. Uh, so it uses the thread per core architecture in order to get the high throughput. Uh, I will uh, elaborate more on that later. Uh, it is a self-tuning. So we try to avoid all the fiddling with configuration variables, which can be very hard in distributed environments. Uh, because every uh, configuration item affects every other configuration item and it can be an endless loop of tuning. And the main use case is uh, online uh, transaction processing. So uh, uh, real time uh, event processing, uh, but we also support analytical processing on the same data. Uh, so you can fire up the Apache Spark on this data and perform uh, your business intelligence queries while the database is serving uh, real-time requests uh, from users. So let's uh, compare uh, throughput and latency and, and see why they are at odds with each other. So they're not really compatible. You can usually achieve uh, one or the other, but it's hard uh, to achieve both. So when we're doing throughput computing, we want to maximize utilization of our resources. We want the CPUs to be at 100%. Uh, we want the disks to be busy. Uh, and we want to uh, buffer a lot of requests so that uh, if there is network latency or latency from the disk, then uh, the CPU isn't idle uh, while it's waiting for responses. So you want to generate a lot of concurrency. And you want to make sure that there is always something more to do. Uh, and it's the total time for an operation. So if you're running a query that takes uh, several minutes or maybe even several hours, uh, what's important is to minimize the total amount of time that the query takes. Uh, and it's okay to uh, um, re reorder or serialize the operation. You, you want uh, the entire batch to be complete as soon as possible and you're willing uh, to trade off the uh, latency of individual operation. Uh, let's contrast it with uh, latency computing, uh, which is uh, often, uh, often denoted by OLTP, online transaction processing. Uh, so there you want to leave some free cycles uh, so that if you have uh, traffic bursts, then uh, you have those cycles to, uh, to absorb them. Uh, you cannot predict the data. And, and so um, you cannot do a read ahead. Uh, and also when you write, uh, you often cannot uh, buffer the data. You must write it immediately in order to uh, ensure durability. 
So you want to be able to promise to your users that uh, if you respond to a write and that write has reached disk and uh, they are sure to read it there. So that increases latency. Uh, it's the individual operation time that's important and not the total runtime of the entire job. Uh, because if you have uh, live humans on the other end of the application, um, they, they've clicked something and they want uh, the web page to appear promptly. They don't care about all of the other users. They care about their own operation. And as uh, the operator of the website, so do you. And you have lots of operations that execute concurrently. Uh, multiple users clicking at the same time, or it can be an application that isn't, uh, aren't, there aren't humans behind it, but still generating a lot of uh, concurrency. So those are quite different. And uh, perhaps the biggest, biggest difference is that uh, for throughput computing, you want to saturate your CPU, while for uh, latency computing, you want to leave free cycles to make sure that uh, when a request comes in, there is a CPU available to process it. So why mix them at all? Um, so there are two answers to that question. First, you might have two different workloads that uh, uh, run on the same uh, data. It's often called hybrid transaction and analytics processing. Uh, and here you're, you have your users who are uh, clicking their way through your website, but you also want to uh, run analytics on the same data. And uh, you could spin up a separate cluster for analytics and run, uh, and run those um, analytics spheres on a separate cluster, but th those are, that's more resources. And you also need to transfer the data, keep the data uh, always synchronized. Uh, it's a lot of hassle and it's better if you can do it uh, on the same cluster. And the second reason is that uh, you have some internal processes within the database um, that look like um, uh, an analytics query. Uh, so uh, one example is garbage collection in, in, a, in a Java virtual machine. So uh, it's a throughput oriented operation. You're running through uh, the entire uh, the entire memory, uh, looking for uh, memories that you can throw away. Uh, and at the same time, you have uh, uh, your application running and processing real-time events. And the same thing happens with a database. So with a database, the garbage collection is a process where you look for uh, records that you can expire or records that uh, became obsolete because they were overwritten and remove them. So you have this uh, garbage collection operations and in a database, it's often done via a log structured uh, merge tree. So that's a very common structure these days for um, maintaining data. Um, and you have uh, cluster maintenance operations. So if you're adding a node, so while, while the nodes are serving those uh, real-time operations, uh, you also need to stream data to new nodes that are being added or stream data from nodes that are being decommissioned, uh, you're performing backup uh, or you're scrubbing nodes, which is looking for errors and correcting them. So all of those operations, um, they, uh, from the point of view of, uh, of, of the system, they look like uh, an analytics query. So they're throughput oriented and they're running in parallel with an OLTP workload. So we have a lot of motivation to make sure that uh, we can run those two operations in parallel without the throughput operation interfering with uh, uh, the, the transactional workload. So how are we going to approach this? The, the general plan is to uh, um, isolate the different tasks that make up. So we want to be able to say about every uh, piece of code and every, um, uh, every IO that goes to disk or to the network, whether it belongs to uh, an OLTP to a, a real-time operation, or whether it bel belongs to an uh, analytics or maintenance operation. So the first step is to identify those tasks and tag them in a way that allows us to um, sort them out later. And the second step is to uh, have a scheduler that picks 
uh, which tasks to execute and when to execute them. And if we're able to do this, then we're able to uh, prevent um, the analytics uh, operations from interfering with the real-time queries. So let's see how we do that. Uh, but before that, we'll uh, show how to achieve the, the, the throughput that uh, we want and how to later how to adapt this to uh, this mixed uh, latency and throughput workloads. So in modern machines, there are uh, lots of uh, a large number of cores. So with the large R machines today, you can see um, 128 cores on the same server. Uh, and there is a large penalty if you try to coordinate work across those many cores. So this means uh, atomic operations or locks, and you have cache line bouncing and uh, um, just selecting which core will be the one to execute the task. All of that itself uh, creates a large penalty. Um, so we would like to avoid it. And the way to avoid it is to recognize that the distributed database already uh, spreads the data across nodes. So we're already able to divide the data uh, among the cluster uh, into individual nodes. So we're just going to extend this and do this uh, for one, um, one other level and also distribute the data among the shards, among cores. So each core becomes the owner of uh, a particular subset of the data. And we just route um, the work that is relating to a particular bit of data to the core that owns it. So compute and storage are co-located. Uh, and we've built a CSTAR framework, which is a C++ open source framework uh, that helps doing that. It's in use by uh, several projects. Uh, I can sell a DB, of course, and I can also mention the vectorized uh, IO, which is a, a streaming framework compatible with Kafka and uh, the Ceph distributed file system by uh, Red Hat uh, and a few others. So this is uh, built exactly for this sort of um, uh, cluster operations. So the idea about shard per core is that uh, uh, individual cores don't share data with each other. And so they don't block each other. You don't need the uh, uh, locks when accessing the data because there is just one core that can access them. And uh, with a single threaded operation, there can be no contention. So uh, it's similar to the uh, image on the right of uh, each puppy eating from its own core. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention about the questions. So uh, you can put your questions in, uh, in the Q&A box if you have any. Uh, so far, I haven't seen uh, any questions. I'm, I'm happy to stop and answer questions as uh, they pop up. Um, so uh, here we also see a comparison between um, the traditional threaded uh, applications and the C star the C star sharded stack. Um, so in a traditional application, you have many threads, and uh, the threads are multiplexes onto cores by the scheduler, and this. Uh, immediately presents a problem of the, how to do this multiplexing if you have. Uh, a large number of threads, this is good for throughput because it means that uh, uh, every, uh, every core will have at least one thread to run. And so we can saturate the machine. Uh, but it also means that uh, you will not be able to guarantee that there are free cycles left for your latency-based uh, computing. And um, if you have a small number of threads, then that's great for latency, but uh, your throughput will be limited because you will not be able to uh, utilize all of your cores. So it's uh, kind of hard to uh, find the perfect fit. And of course, it always uh, varies with the workload itself. Uh, with CSTAR, uh, we have exactly one thread per core. Uh, and uh, we, we run the same, uh, the same database stack on each core and those um, uh, stacks communicate to, uh, with each other with point-to-point -point queues. So instead of um, taking a lock in order to access uh, uh, 
shared memory. Instead, do, uh, the individual cores send messages to each other via queues, and uh, they can proceed with some other work until the response come, uh, comes back via the response queue. So this is a, a cooperative model uh, where uh, instead of taking locks, um, the individual tasks wait for each other uh, at predefined points in order to check for completion. So let's see how we, uh, we make uh, latency and throughput uh, behave nicely with each other on, for CPU workloads. This is uh, the easier part. The second part will be IO, which will be a little bit more difficult. So remember, we wanted to isolate the task and then schedule them. So uh, the traditional model where you isolate a task in a thread, then every task, say a request from a web request, becomes a thread and often you borrow it from a thread pool and you let the schedule, uh, let the kernel decide which thread comes first. And you can try to uh, influence the kernel choices by raising or reducing the, the thread priority. Um, so the advantages of that are uh, that it's well understood and uh, it has a huge ecosystem and Although you might think from uh, the size of the disadvantage list that uh, I'm a little bit biased, and I am, uh, those advantages are really very important and uh, 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 they're well worth uh, uh, considering. So uh, unless you have a very specialized application, it's really good to go down the well-trodden path um, uh, and uh, suffer the disadvantages. But if you are writing a high throughput application, then it's also worth to consider the disadvantages. So context switches that arise from a pack packing operations to thread, they're pretty expensive and they're actually getting more expensive uh, because of things like uh, specter and meltdown mitigations. Um, telling the priority to the operating system is uh, not that easy. Uh, the priority levels are not meaningful, so you cannot predict what, priority, what a particular priority level will, uh, what it will result in in terms of response time. Um, locking, when you have a large number of threads, it becomes very complicated and very expensive. So locking uh, eats into your compute budget. Uh, it's possible to have a priority inversion uh, where a low priority task is holding a lock that is needed by a high priority task and uh, blocking its, uh, its progress. And the kernel does its scheduling on its own granularity and it may be uh, inducing latency in this way. So what we chose is to do a task isolation in, um, in a, at the application level. And here, instead of a, a thread, every operation is just a normal object with uh, a function pointer that tells us what's the operation uh, uh, that is needed to do. And the operations are multiplexed on our thread per core architecture. So if you have a machine with, I don't know, 30 cores, then you will have 30 threads, each executing one task at a time. But you can alternate between throughput and latency tasks. Uh, and this is the key. Uh, so here you have the choice whether to execute uh, a latency sensitive task. And after you've run out of uh, latency sensitive tasks, you can use the remaining spare cycles to run a throughput oriented task. Uh, and you have the concurrency framework, which is CSTAR in our case, that does this assignment of task to thread and controlling the order uh, crucially. So, What's, what are the advantages and disadvantages here? Um, so one advantage is that you have uh, a full control and, uh, and that means that uh, uh, if, if you identify any problem, you can go ahead and fix it. But you'll notice I also listed it as a disadvantage. So uh, full control also, also means that uh, you're responsible for everything and uh, uh, there's, Many more, um, uh, many more bugs to chase down and strange behaviors 
So it takes more time to uh, mature such uh, uh, a system compared to the traditional system. Um, it has very low overhead. Uh, so the scheduling is cooperative. So you never need to take any locks or perform atomic operations. Um, and the CPU affinity is, uh, is wonderful. So you never have cases where uh, you have cache, line cache lines bouncing around and uh, poor performance on a large machine. Um, and the kernel is less involved. So the kernel, which is a big and complicated beast, uh, will, have, uh, uh, will give you fewer surprises to your application. So this is how it looks like. You have uh, uh, a bunch of tasks represented by the small rectangles. And they're placed into uh, task queues. And um, uh, remember, we've uh, uh, identified every task. We've uh, tagged it in a way which identifies whether it is, it is a latency sensitive task or a throughput oriented task. So we can sort them into individual queues. And uh, each queue has its own, uh, its own priority class. And so the scheduler can tell uh, what kind of tasks are waiting to be scheduled and for each task queue, what its priority is. This is uh, the key to the whole thing. And the way the execution goes is that the scheduler will pick uh, a task queue and will pick some task from the task queue and keep uh, uh, executing those tasks until one of two things happen. One is that the the scheduler runs out of tasks in, in that task queue. And the other is that uh, a timer tick happens. And our timer tick is every half a millisecond. Um, so in this way, uh, we ensure a good locality. So it's important to execute similar tasks uh, back to back so that uh, the CPU hardware mechanisms like uh, the instruction cache and the branch prediction work well. Um, but also uh, to not let the one task you monopolize uh, the CPU by preempting it uh, when needed. So uh, the scheduler will uh, alternate between task queues, pick a bunch of tasks. Uh, you can have a bunch of small tasks uh, uh, running within um, a time slice, or you can have one large task that's occupying the entire time slice. So when do we switch queue? Um, one is uh, one option is when the queue is exhausted, and this is common for your uh, real-time operations. Uh, you have a bunch of queries that uh, appeared on on the network, and uh, uh, you start processing them. And when you've done, you switch over and, and do something else. And for the throughput-oriented jobs, those are large jobs that take many seconds. And therefore, they're being uh, preempted. Uh, so you, you start a task. You see that it took more than um, half, uh, half a millisecond. So you stop it and move on to the next uh, task queue. Um, every time you switch between task queues, you also uh, poll for IO. So you check if you have a new task uh, by looking for network events or for um, IO completions from the disk. And at that time, you make a scheduling decision, uh, which is what is the next queue from which I will pick my task. And uh, your goal is to um, keep the runtime um, uh, equal across the queues, but weighted by the number of shares that we assign to each queue. So if a queue has a large number of shares, it will get proportionately more runtime than a queue that has a small number of shares. So it's not the round robin, and this allows us to uh, give higher priority to uh, our real-time task and lower priority to our um, to our throughput-oriented tasks. So, how do we preempt those tasks? Uh, one option is to read the, the clock. Um, um, uh, at the head of every loop and compare it to a time slice end. That's incredibly expensive. So uh, we don't do that. 
Um, another option is to ask the kernel to send a, a signal uh, whenever um, um, every half millisecond. And uh, this works. Uh, it's a little bit problematic on large machines because of the way that the uh, signal locking works, but it does work. And the way that uh, we do is um, uh, we use um, uh, a kernel timer to write to a memory location. And then we just uh, call that memory location to see if it ever changed. And there are nice techniques involving IRU ring that uh, allows you to do that. It's a little bit tricky, but also very efficient. Uh, when you do something like that, you're completely in control. And that also gives us the ability to uh, create problems for yourself. Uh, and that is when you have a complex computation that doesn't check the, pre the preemption mechanism. Uh, and so we have a stall detector, uh, which is a, a signal me based mechanism that uh, logs an entry whenever it detects that uh, a task is not uh, preempted in time. Um, and uh, we use that in order to uh, detect problem errors in the code and, and fix them. So that was a part about the uh, CPU. Uh, let's look at IO, which is in some ways similar. So the goals are similar, but the details are quite different. So again, uh, we want to isolate the tasks that we have to see which IOs are part of latency uh, sensitive operations and which IOs are part of our throughput oriented computations. Uh, and we want to schedule those IOs at the time that we want. So IOs are uh, uh, simpler to identify. Every time you issue a, a disk read or disk write, you, you know that you're doing it and you can uh, easily um, tag this IO with um, some kind of markers that tells you whether it's, um, uh, whether it's part of a two-boot oriented operation or a, a real-time operation. And there are just four types. You have uh, random reads, random writes, and sequential reads and writes. Uh, but in practical terms, it is uh, much more complicated. So first, those disks are, are physical devices. They are not those cores that uh, are more um, just machines that execute instructions. Instead, their, um, their behavior changes with time. So if you're talking about hard disk, they have heads that move and you need to uh, take into account the time that it takes the head to move. Uh, and even solid state drives, which appear to be um, more, like, uh, uh, more like RAM, uh, they also have uh, strange behavior. Um, if you write to them in, uh, if you perform random access writes, after a while, their, uh, their write performance starts to deteriorate because they need to perform uh, internal wear leveling and, and garbage collection. Uh, so uh, they're physical beings with uh, more complicated operation. And uh, it keeps changing both with time and also depending on your deployments. So different disks can behave very differently. So let's compare CPU to IO. Um, so in, on a CPU, tasks are homogenous. You have uh, uh, basically a, a pointer to a function and you execute that, that function. Uh, but with IO, um, tasks are wildly different. So they can be uh, small reads that require disk six, or they can be large sequential writes. Uh, and the disks have very different limits to different types of IOs. Uh, with a CPU, you can have each core schedule its own task. So there is no coordination penalty. Uh, but with a disk, you can do that. You have uh, usually fewer disks than you have cores. So you need to share disks among cores. And that means you need to do uh, coordination. Um, the capacity of a core. You, you know it in advance. So you, you know that uh, a core can give you uh, one CPU second every second. And, uh, but the disk uh, performance depends on the workload. Uh, 
And of course, you're running multiple workloads at the same time. So it's hard to predict the disk performance. Uh, and with a core, uh, it will run one task at a time. If you, even if you're running threads, uh, at any particular time, a core is running just one thread. Uh, but disk, uh, they need multiple requests. Otherwise, they, you will not be able to utilize them. Um, so disks are uh, internally are uh, parallel machines. And so they require concurrency in order to operate uh, to their full capacity. So the one challenge uh, that uh, we can solve about cross-core coordination is using leases. So uh, have, um, uh, we can have uh, uh, each disk um, in virtually lease out uh, and um, uh, some of its capacity. So let's say a disk can do 100,000 operations per second and we have 10 cores. So we can lease out uh, uh, a, a few operations at a time to every core. And this way we can um, achieve uh, sharing of the disk capacity uh, among the cores without static partitioning, which is where every core gets exactly one tenth of the capacity. And so we, we leave some capacity unused if, um, if not every core claims it's their capacity. So it's an ability to do dynamic sharing um, without oversubscri oversubscribing the, core, the, the disk. Um, so one thing we need to do is to decide on how many requests we, we can feed the disk. And let's limit the discussion to an SSD because that's what most people use these days. So usually you have four different parameters that uh, describe the disk. Uh, you have the read uh, throughput and the write throughput in megabytes per second, usually two different numbers. And you have the read IO operations per second and write IO operations per second. Again, two very different numbers. So overall, four parameters. And of course, the larger, uh, uh, the larger those parameters, the better your disk. But the story uh, doesn't end well. So it doesn't, uh, isn't so simple. So uh, this um, chart demonstrates how the disk behaves when you mix and match different workloads. So on the x-axis, we, um, um, we have a write workload that starts from zero all the way up to the maximum capacity of the disk. And on the y-axis, we have um, a read workload uh, that starts from zero IOPS all the way to the maximum IOPS that uh, the disk can support. Uh, and in the matrix, you can see uh, how the disk behaves uh, with each combination of workloads. So on the bottom left, we are um, pushing low, low workloads on both the write and the read. And on the top right, uh, we're pushing a high uh, read workload in parallel with the high write workload. And you can see that the disk is not full duplex. It cannot process both workloads uh, concurrently. Uh, there is a region in which uh, uh, it will simply not be able to sustain the workload. There is a region where it will work well, and there is some kind of gray area uh, where uh, it sort of works, but the latency starts to shoot high. And our goal is to stay off this gray area, and that's, that's what our scheduler should do. It should schedule just enough uh, requests uh, to keep within um, the, uh, the good zone. So let's see how this is implemented in SailorDB and in CSTAR where actually most of the code lives. Well, this is a quick reminder of, of what the SailorDB is. So the scheduler has two jobs. The first is whether, to, whether it has room uh, to admit a new task. So um, uh, for, for the case of IO, uh, if the scheduler admits a new task, uh, will, that, uh, will that new IO cause a disk to go over the limit and start incurring high latency? Or uh, whether um, it will um, 
the disk has sufficient capacity and it can uh, accept the new task, the new IO without a problem. And once we've uh, answered the first question, the second one is uh, of the, all of the IOs that uh, we have pending, uh, which, uh, which IO should I admit? And the same, um, the same goes for CPU. So we have a bunch of uh, CPU tasks that are waiting. We first need to decide whether we want to uh, admit a new task to uh, the CPU. Here it's easy. If the CPU is, uh, uh, is idle, then we should admit a new task. And um, again, the same, uh, the, the second question is also the same. Which, which of the tasks that are waiting should I admit? Uh, and this is the basic structure of, uh, of the scheduler. Uh, for each uh, queue of tasks, we assign shares. Uh, so every workload is characterized by the number of shares that it has. A higher number of shares means that we will accept more tasks from, uh, from uh, that queue. Uh, and the scheduler alternates between uh, picking the task, uh, dispatching an op to the resource that is being controlled, and the resource can be the disk or a CPU. Uh, and um, we get a result from that and continue and move on to uh, the next uh, task. Um, and this is the key to how, uh, um, how to limit the impact of the throughput oriented tasks on latency. Uh, we simply don't admit uh, throughput tasks if there will be an impact on latency. Um, so how do we assign those uh, shares? There are two ways to do that. So the first is to have uh, um, uh, an internal controller that uh, selects the number of shares dynamically. And this is uh, mostly for internal maintenance tasks where the user does not have uh, the ability to, uh, or the desire to tune everything. Uh, they want to spend their time elsewhere. So you want to uh, have the system automatically determine the correct number of shares that are needed uh, to accomplish the maintenance task, say streaming to a new node, uh, but without uh, affecting the two boot loads. So the way this works, we have the various queues. Um, in, in our case, we have uh, the commit log and query queues, those represent uh, the, the real-time queries that come from users and commit log uh, represent the writes. Um, and we have the various other uh, queues which are uh, used for, um, for maintenance tasks. And the scheduler is balancing between them. So compaction is one of the important um, maintenance tasks, which is uh, trying to balance uh, reads and write. And uh, uh, in, in order to decide on the right number of shares for the compaction task, uh, we monitor the backlog that the compaction has. So if compaction is falling behind, uh, we will increase its shares. And so we will increase the amount of resources that it takes from the CPU and, and disk. Uh, and this will allow it to um, uh, uh, reduce its backlog. And on the, other, on, on the other hand, if we see that the backlog is falling, it means that uh, uh, we are making progress and we can reduce the number of shares again and allow um, the user tasks of uh, serving queries and, and writing data um, to have a larger share uh, and uh, receive a lower latency. The same we have with, uh, uh, with memory. So CDDB accumulates uh, writes in memory. And uh, um, whenever memory gets full, it starts flushing those writes to disk. Uh, this is a very efficient way of uh, performing writes because you only need to access a disk sequentially uh, as opposed to randomly, which is the way that it happens with traditional uh, B3 storage formats. But uh, if you run out of uh, free memory, then you will end up uh, not, not being able to serve any writes at all. So the way we do that is we monitor the amount of free memory that uh, we have. And if we see that we're starting to run low, we initiate a flush uh, 
and we assign uh, uh, assign the number of shares to the flush that uh, allows us to keep accepting new writes. So we ensure that we uh, flush memory to disk at the same rate that we have uh, incoming writes. And so we dynamically balance between uh, the rate of uh, the disk flush with the, the incoming rate. And so we're not flushing too fast, uh, which would be a waste of resources, or too slow, which would cause us to um, not have the ability to accept new writes if we run out of memory. So we can also do the same thing with um, um, uh, with uh, different user workloads. And um, we do that by letting the user uh, assign shares to different uh, query queues. So say you have an, uh, um, a real-time workload, let's call that uh, query one, and then analytics workload, let's call that query two. And they're running in parallel, but you would like the analytics workload not to interfere with a real-time workload. So you can assign the priority, different priorities to query one and query two. Um, and by having a higher number of shares for the real-time workload, you ensure that the, the analytics workload um, doesn't interfere with it. It can still make progress, but it will not, uh, uh, it will not uh, cause uh, the latency to increase when it starts using up uh, resources. It will basically only use uh, spare resources left over from uh, the real-time workload. Um, and we have uh, uh, SQL commands that allow you to um, adjust the number of shares for different workloads. So it works um, on, on the session level. Uh, basically, every session that connects to the database is really using a separate queue at the back end. And um, that's it uh, from me. And um, I'm happy to take questions if there are any. I think I see a question. Um, so how is this being used in, in real world applications? Um, so one, one example that we have is, uh, um, I think I mentioned it, is uh, Spark uh, versus um, uh, real-time workloads. So many companies like to uh, use Spark for analytics but Spark can gobble up a large amount of uh, data. Uh, and if you aren't careful and you don't use something like uh, uh, workload prioritization, then you end up uh, having the Spark workload dominate over uh, your real-time workload. And um, uh, this can cause a disruption. And with this system, you can uh, run the Spark workload just on the spare capacity uh, of the system. And uh, I see another question. Um, so uh, I'll read the question. I think the scheduler operates on supervised machine learning in feedback. Uh, so uh, it's not exactly supervised machine learning. We use the really simple uh, proportional controller algorithm. Uh, uh, I think it would make a, a good study to see if uh, machine learning can uh, improve on it. Uh, I'm not a machine learning expert, so uh, uh, we didn't really try uh, machine learning, but certainly uh, um, with machine learning, you could uh, learn the characteristics of the disk uh, in, in real time. And so um, avoid having to measure the parameters of the disk ahead of time. Uh, so certainly it would make a very interesting project. Uh, we didn't do that yet, but I agree that uh, uh, there's room for, uh, for investigation here. 
um, uh, I, I would love to uh, have more knowledge in machine learning in order to know how to do that. Um, okay, I see another question. So how many different workloads can you reasonably prioritize? Um, so the number is a, a handful. We, we don't really see uh, uh, lots of cases that demand more than that. Um, I guess um, microservices applications uh, can benefit from having a very large number of workloads that operate concurrently on the same database. We did not reach uh, that level yet. Uh, so if you have uh, a five or eight workloads, um, then that's a, the system can deal with them. But if you have many more, then uh, it just becomes um, uh, just selecting between so many queues, you, you, cannot, uh, you cannot reach a good decision at, at all times. So, uh, um, Five to eight is uh, is what you can reasonably be expected to do. Do we have time for more? Let me check the time. So I see, I see a question if we uh, pull, uh, did, did Sela switch to using uh, <clears throat> IOU ring from uh, AIO? So I mentioned IOU ring for, uh, uh, because it's just a hot topic. In reality, we're still using uh, Linux AIO. It performs just as well, or maybe it's a little bit less performant. Um, but uh, for our purposes, it's fine. We will eventually switch to uh, IO Uring uh, since it's such a, such a popular uh, API. Uh, one more question. Is there a need for a separation of internode via intranode level shard replica configuration? Um, I ask because I think you mentioned the intent to avoid configuration as much as possible. Uh, so the uh, intranode configuration is completely automatic. Uh, when the system is installed, it detects the number of shards and it divides the data equally among the shards. Uh, it is possible to override some of the decisions, but uh, there's really very little that, uh, that you need to do there. And um, it's, it's mostly automatic. There is uh, uh, you don't really have uh, uh, intranode configuration, so all of all of the configuration is at the node level and above, and usually all of the node level configuration is uh, um, is equivalent, and you manage it with a configuration management tool like Ansible uh, or Kubernetes. Uh, so all of the configuration is handled at the uh, at the higher level. Okay, and uh, uh, I think we're uh, uh, we've exhausted our time. So thanks everyone for attending, and uh, you can always uh, ask questions on our mailing list or on uh, Twitter. Uh, follow me on Twitter, and uh, um, thanks again. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Avi, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. Just a quick reminder that this recording will be posted to the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. All right, have a good one, everyone. Thank you.